it's my honor and privilege to welcome all of all karam yogis today to this edition of karam yogi talks and we have for this edition professor david eames with us who is a professor from university college uh, london and he comes up with a la with a long experience of teaching digital te- digital government researching in the field of digital government about how technologies can help governance and he has also worked in the industry and we brings up with a vast experience of having studied how different governments are using technology for transforming the lives of citizens so on this edition i will have a few questions with the professor to help us learn about what we can do better in india as you know india has been using digital technologies for transforming lives you did a case study on aadhar and we are trying to ensure that more and more citizens lives are benefited when they interact with the government with using technology and when we build such systems there are several policy options that are involved like how do we build systems how do we ensure that the legacy systems which are very often based on silos are integrated with the with, with each other and then the systems talk to each other so what in your mind are the benefits of building integrated systems and based on the experience that you have had of studying similar systems in other countries how can a country like india adapt to to the to that kind of approach yeah thank you great question and really exciting to be here and be with all the karma yogis um so i think the the kind of history of government has been to create digital systems that mirrored the paper bureaucracy that's existed for the last 200 years. And so every time a system was every time somebody wanted to offer a service, they kind of built a vertical technology system that that delivered that service and kind of kept all the information siloed inside that digital system. And so in many governments around the world you have these kind of silos built over and over and over and over again that are offering up different services and that has led to a huge amount of duplication, but also um as things have moved on to the web and on to smartphones now people are confronted with very different experiences every t- when they touch one silo they get one experience when they touch another silo they get another experience and it's actually quite confusing to your citizens and so there's been a real effort to think about like how do we create a great experience both visually on how a, how a, how a citizen gets a service but then also as people look deeper they said wow there's all this duplication like we're doing the same thing over and over again like most of these services actually have a lot in common could we create some common ways of doing this and then at the very bottom that we're actually collecting all sorts of data over and over again so we're always asking me for my address and like what my job is and could we collect that last and be smarter about it so part of the drive around this is about efficiency can we can we have fewer systems that are serving more services and that would reduce the kind of footprint that we have to create that we have to build and create and manage and that could be a lot cheaper there's also a compelling piece here around um a a benefit to the citizen of, of simplicity now if you actually gather data and store it you know kind of more once and then shared it across ministries you could then pull that data and pre-populate all the forms or even some governments think now just not have forms at all just look at the data and auto enroll you in the service if you need it So those are real benefits. I think that the the counter tension for that is as you as your government gets smarter and can consolidate more information and consolidate more services like the big tech companies, it starts to know more about you. And that can be have positive angles where it can offer you more services and better services, but it also means it's maybe better able to surveil you and know more about you. And so it's it's how do we manage the trust and safety around that? exactly in fact that's what we in india like we are doing thinking of doing that because now that we have an identifier like aadhar which is seeded in several databases and we are able to identify like if there are some people who are deserving of one particular service and the eligibility conditions of some other service similar to that do we need the citizens to apply for them again and then do a last mile beneficiary checks to before we can deliver the service or can we just based on the discovery of a beneficiary in a particular scheme be the reason enough for offering it to the same who meets the eligibility conditions so that becomes like entitlement based auto delivery of services and eligibility based delivery of services rather than a citizen applying and getting for uh, getting their service so that is exactly the kind of benefits we're thinking about i i think for me what's what's really interesting is this all still presumes that we organize the state in the same way and maybe rather than thinking about the state purely in terms of traditional ministries we should start thinking about the state of being composed of ministries that are delivering services but maybe there's some new horizontal parts or yeah horizontal parts of the state that are taking care of some of these shared services that we could regulate in different ways so we could balance the interest of sharing information to provide public good with the concerns around privacy more in a different and new way 
And it works very well because what we also observed is that very often the citizens for whom the services are built, they don't even know which ministry or which department is delivering their service. The citizen only knows government as one organic whole. Yeah. He doesn't care whether it's organized into various departments or silos. But that we do it for our convenience. So a citizen would ideally like to go to a government.com and ask for this is how I want. And then it's up to the government, the back end to divide or to decide to, to like whether agriculture is offering their service or health is offering or education is offering. And then she should be able to do that. So when we interlink services, maybe we can enable that kind of interface as well. Yeah, and so I think the key here is, is how do we build trust by doing that in ways that's helpful to people and find ways to make sure that we're managing the downsides of that. Because you could also use that data sharing to be punitive. Like you might discover, oh, um, because you have this service, but you've claimed this on your taxes, something is wrong. And so now we want to investigate you. That there's a The, the state has a legitimate interest in doing that. But at the same time, if we become too punitive, people will not trust the state. And so we have to figure out how to manage that well. One of my, my favorite examples of this is, I, I just think the kind of deep rethinking we need in this space is, um, there was a comedian once who said something like, uh, you know, he's filing his taxes. And he says, um, uh, okay, I wanna file my taxes. And the government's like, great, fill out this form. And he goes, but um, uh, you already know all this information. And like, yeah, we knew, but we still want you to fill it out. And he's like, well, what happens if I get it wrong? We arrest you. So it was like, <laughs> the government already knows all the information or knows most of it, and but you have to go through the dance of filling it out. And then if you get it wrong, so how do we change this in a way that makes it easier for citizens, but gives them trust and confidence in government at the same time? So building trust becomes a very, very key, key uh, hugely important key issue in this, all these things that we do. And the second thing is like, very often uh, people also say that uh, when the government gets to know a lot, then can there be a case in which there is a risk for that data being used for something else? Yeah. So how do we ring face against that? How do we build protocols in to ensure that the, any data the government has can be used for any for only the purpose for which it is meant for? There are any use cases or any examples worldwide with regard to this approach where it has worked? So two things. One is actually one of the challenges of only using the data for the purposes it was collected for precludes you from actually creating value it precludes you from doing harm, but it also precludes you from creating from creating value. So when if I collect data for one service, and then I knew actually I have four more services that if I could look at that data, I could offer that to a citizen, um, we're, we're now prevented from doing that. So I think we have to be careful in thinking about that piece. I also, I think we're not completely in uncharted waters. Um, we It's not like government has never collected data information before, and there have been models for thinking about this. So um, one is, um, you know, in many parliamentary systems, you have like uh, quasi-autonomous government organizations that have collected like um, business registry information, um, healthcare records that live in entities that are sponsored or funded or even even owned by the government, but actually are arm's length or independent of government. And that's designed to prevent a government official from reaching in and being able to use that data without consent. Um, and so I think we have some models that are kind of interesting in that way. Um, the other thing that I think is interesting is um, thinking about uh, um, statistical agencies, you know, uh, statistical agencies have a long tradition now of collecting, you know, quite sensitive information about citizens, and we've built norms and rules around them to protect that data so it gets used for the benefit of society but can't be abused by the government to go and target particular people. So I think statistical agents, agencies for me offer kind of a window into what are some of the parameters for how to build trust and safety in the collecting of the data. Yeah, and uh, really like we all keep all talking about okay, like uh, database decision making and database analytics, which keeps in uh, which keeps the government insights with regard to how to be how to offer better service. And ultimately, it's the job of the government to offer better services. And if technology or data analytics or collecting data, building intelligence on that data helps us design that system, then ideally it should be something that should be encouraged. Yeah, I mean, one one thing I definitely am concerned about is um, that the private sector will will get very, very effective at using data to provision services very effectively. And you already see that, like many websites, if you go shopping, you know, it'll say, oh, you bought these three things, we think you'd like these four things. And sometimes those things are annoying, but sometimes you're like, oh yeah, actually, that's genuinely interesting and that's real, that is real value. And And our governments are unable right now to say, hey, you've done these three things, you actually qualify for this benefit, or we think you've made a mistake and you should fix it before the auditors look at your accounts. Like there's so many proactive things the government could be doing. And I worry that the private sector will get so far ahead, people will just begin to feel like the government is incompetent or not capable or stupid. 
and that will actually erode trust in government. So we have this risk on this side. So figuring out how to do this is of central importance. So basically, the situation may come that if a farmer has used a service of buying seeds or fertilizers or access to microfinance before the cropping season, then when the system knows that the farmer would have produced this, then the government procurement agency can come to the farmer that we are here to buy your produce. Yes, and, and the question is, how do we do all this in a way that makes people feel like their 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 data is, is safeguarded and that it's not going to be used against them? In fact, that's what uh, one of the initiatives that has been taken up in India. We call it the account aggregator framework, in which what is being done is that uh, the financial data which is available, like uh, very often most banks and uh, credit agencies give you loans and uh, loans only on the basis of your financial strength that you have. And very often people don't have uh, assets to mortgage, but they have their financial record, the tax returns that they have filed, the GST returns that they have uh, filed, or the cash flows that they have, the bank statements that they have. So, so based on that, that data collecting, being collected from various sources is being aggregated. And then using that to give credit to, to people who want that. So that's something a very powerful use of data to offer financial services to those who need that. Yeah, and I know here in India that the one intent has been to kind of use a form of data trusts where you know users would be able to consent to where their data gets shared, which I think is an interesting model. Um, I think another thing to think about is what is who are the right actors to be doing this work. So I think in some countries, um, people have trust in the national government and are happy to let the national government aggregate data and share. Others um, don't have that kind of confidence and prefer to tr rely on a regional government or they're, they're, more, they're more accepting of a regional government and are, are even more accepting of a local government doing it, as, especially if they feel like that, that, that government is kind of uh, firewalled off from other levels of government. And then sometimes, some places, people are, have more confidence in the private sector in doing it. So part of this too is it's gonna be different for every country. In a country as big as India, it might even be different, a little bit different from state to state. There may be different norms and different values that, that drive different models. One very important challenge that we face when we are implementing digital transformation projects at all levels, especially when we go down to the state government levels and to the local government levels, is that there is actually a lack of capacity within the government for people to lead these projects and implement these projects. So the Karam Yogi Bharat, the platform that we are speaking on, seeks to impart these skills in an online mode with online learning and all. You think, uh, since you have been teaching for a long time, what impact can online learning can make for imparting these kind of skills to people? Yeah, so I've spent a lot of the last 10 years thinking about what is the minimum viable knowledge that public leaders need to have about technology to be effective in their job. So when you come to a master's of public administration program like the one I teach in, there's a, a certain baseline of knowledge that we try to teach you. So there's a typically you show up and there's a requirement to take some economics, there's some requirement to take some statistics, there's a requirement to take some um, ethics. Uh, uh, maybe um, some management class, certainly something on political institutions. So there's these required courses, um, but there's almost never anything about technology. And I think one of the things you have to accept is you're never going to be able to sit everybody down for 200 hours of teaching on technology. We certainly are, can't expect that every public servant is going to become a data scientist or a software engineer or even a service designer. The real question is actually, what is the minimum amount that we need to teach people for them to be effective in their role. And I think as you get more junior in the organization, there's more you need to know about a narrower domain. So if you're gonna be a software engineer building systems like Adahar or UPI, you need to actually be a software engineer and have all the skills of, of software development under your belt and you have to stay skilled up. But as you get more and more and more senior, as you become someone who's overseeing, you know, if you're the CEO of, of Adahar, you may not be a software engineer but you have to have some minimum knowledge to be able to have intelligent conversations with the engineering team and with the product management team. And so what is that minimum amount of knowledge? And so this is what I think the, you know, the school here needs to be thinking about is how do we figure out that minimum amount? Okay, so that's, that's very important. In fact, that's what, and that other challenge that we face when we build online learning, and I'm sure during COVID you would also experience is that the attention spans of people are really, really short. So yes. We are trying to, and ensure that the courses that we make, and especially since we are targeting people who are 40 plus, 50 plus, we need to make content that's short, that's snackable, that's engaging. Yes. And also relates to some case studies, examples. Otherwise, the interest level that people have goes, goes down. Yeah, so I think there's two pieces there. One is um, you've got to have great pedagogy. So you have to have teachers who are passionate about what they're teaching about and have really thought about how to communicate um, the knowledge they have 
in a way that the audience can digest and understand. And they have to love it because nobody wants to learn from someone who doesn't genuinely love what they're teaching. So it, it sounds kind of a little superficial and trite, but actually that passion matters a great deal. And then they have to be able to package it down into kind of those minimum ch like bites that someone can consume while commuting to work or you know um, taking a break during work so they can kind of watch this video and kind of get what they need out of it. And so you know, figuring out the right content and then delivering it in a way that people want to learn. And, and for me, like one metric I'd have is when a video ends, does your student click to watch the next video? Because if the answer is yes, then the, probably the pedagogy, the person, and the content have all magically aligned and the, the learner doesn't want to stop learning. Yes, that's a very interesting point. And, uh, and I think that's where the most of the like OTT platform that you see, they make you like the web series, they make you click next. So we have to always, and very often you see the way those uh, shows are designed. At the end of it, they leave something that makes you start thinking. That's right. And similarly, when you are doing courses, probably we need to think of like not ending as I've concluded it, but giving it a hook so that one thinks of what more one can learn. Yeah, what's the next thing? How do you, what's the thing that takes you deeper? And then allow the student, you know, to be excited and always want to go deeper, but realizing at some point they get to a place where they're like, I've gone deep enough and now I'm good. And that's an okay outcome. We can't, again, we can't expect everyone to become a software engineer. So how do we get people down that funnel deep enough where they need to go to do the job that they need to do? Because there's no shortage of other skills they need to learn. Yes. So it has been an engaging conversation with you, David, and I'm sure in the days to come, we will have more opportunities to interact with you and learn from you. So what do you think, like uh, having studied India's digital transformation story, one last question that I would like to ask you. What is it that you are expecting India to do next and what is it that you think India should be doing next? Yeah, so I think, you know, India is definitely among a group of countries that's really leading in the thinking around, particularly the use of infrastructure as a way to transform the way governments work. So I think it's enormously exciting. So one expectation I have is to continue that journey. Um, I think there are, there are more types of elements that one can think of about being infrastructure, but I think more importantly, pushing those benefits out to local governments, regional governments, getting more people onto these systems so they start to benefit from the efficiencies and the scale of those systems. That's the first thing I'd expect. The second thing I'd expect is still more thought on governance. I think the, the, the key thing for India is it's so big and it's so diverse that the risks of exclusion are always real. This is true in any country. Um, even a small country, but, but India is so big and so diverse. And so how are we always trying to think about how are we reaching every single person? And when there's a problem, really focus on remediation. How do we make sure nobody gets left behind? Um, and then the third is, is um, how do we build governance that's trust and like, that, that builds confidence and trust and safety? And so um, what, is the, what are both the legal frameworks and then the policy frameworks we want to put in place so that the India is a leader, not just on the technology side, but on the governance side as well. Yeah, great. So it was great talking to Professor David Eames for this edition of Karamiri Talks. And uh, happy to get feedback from you all to ensure that we keep on continuing these series. Thank you. Thank you.